Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Pau and the Finchaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill Committee in 2017. The first item on our agenda today is to consider whether to take item three and future considerations of evidence and of our consideration st stage report in private. Are we agreed? agreed? Thank you. The second item on our agenda today is to take evidence on the objections to the bill and I welcome everybody to the meeting today. Of the three objectors, only Tom Davis is in attendance today. Neither Mr Bruce nor Mr and Mrs Beesham are able to attend. The committee is grateful to the promoters for providing a new written submission ahead of this meeting. Before we proceed, as this is an unfamiliar process to most of us, and I include the committee in that as well, I will briefly explain it and how the meeting will proceed. There are two distinct phases to consideration stage. The first phase, which begins today, involves us meeting in a quasi-judicial capacity to consider and dispose of the objections. And the second phase will see the committee meet in a legislative capacity to consider and dispose of any amendments lodged to the bill and to consider each section, schedule and the long title of the bill. At today's meeting, the objector and promoters will have the opportunity to set out their arguments and to test those arguments through cross-examination. I, as convener, will manage those proceedings. The committee will predominantly listen to both sides, but may come in at times to seek clarification on an issue or to help move things along. The committee may also highlight issues made in the other two objections, given that these objectors are not present today. I will first invite Tom Davis to set out the points that he wishes to make in relation to his objections. The, pr the promoters will then have an opportunity to cross-examine Mr Davis. After this, the roles will be reversed, so the promoters will respond to the points made in the objections and make any other points, and Mr Davis will have an opportunity to cross-examine the promoters. Either party can make a reference to or respond, or respond to points made in uh, the issues raised by the other objectors who are not in attendance today. Once we reach the end of the session, there will be an opportunity for each party to make a brief closing statement. The committee will then reflect on what we have heard and come to a view when we meet on Wednesday, 17th January 2018. We will now move to the formal evidence session, and I encourage all speakers to be as concise as possible. I invite Tom Davis to open proceedings by setting out the points he wishes to make regarding his objection. Mr Davis. Mention that we, the promoter, has prepared some papers um, for everyone here. They're, they're public papers which I would intend to be using for questioning Mr. Davis. I don't know if to, just now would be a suitable time to distribute them, or do you want to do it after Mr. Davis has spoken? I'm Certainly, if you wish to do it just now, so okay. proceedings aren't interrupted. Thank you. If I could just, just briefly introduce these papers. There's an inventory that goes with these papers, but these are just for the convenience uh, of, of everyone, really, so we can get through the matters uh, quickly and effectively this morning. OK. Thank you very much, Mr McKee. Mr Davis, I invite you to go ahead. Thank, thank you. Uh, first, I apologise for my lateness this morning. Um, having three small children in the house often jeopardises your plan as you attempt to leave, and, and that was no different this morning, I'm sure, as many of us are aware. Um, I've drafted uh, my um, thoughts uh, in notes and I will read from those and I'll be as concise as I possibly can. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to give evidence to this session. Uh, this is something which is new to me, I've not done this before, but I, as I said I've gathered my thoughts in, in my notes and I'll refer to these throughout the meeting. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the, the work and knowledge both Joe Guest and Hugh Grierson have undertaken and their commitment to the maintenance of their land. Similarly, I take responsibility to protect my, in comparison, very modest ownership seriously, which is why I'm sitting here today and setting out my objection. 
I live in my property, Ordina Square, with my wife and three small children, having moved there in 2010 after living in Dunblane for some time. I was unaware of the POW when we moved in and the 1846 Act. Uh, however, like the committee, I've become very familiar with the POW. Its purpose, some of its history is uh, associated with its inception, construction and subsequent maintenance. I'm not a farmer or a landowner like Joe and Hugh. However, I, ha I have worked in a land-based industry for over 20 years, dealing with land use change on a fairly significant scale with the consequential effects on the water environment. And whilst I'm not a hydrologist, nor pretend to be an expert on such matters, I have knowledge and experience of drainage and flooding matters. I want, on, want to move on to my objection in detail, and I will do so. However, before I do that, I just wish to make some broad points of summary, and then I will go through uh, the, my objection in detail. I maintain my objection to the bill and believe it requires substantial amendment before it could be considered acceptable to be passed into law. I consider the proposed bill to be unfair, disproportionate, lacking any evidence base, and will confer significant power onto a small group of landowners who are very much the minority of those covered by the bill. There appear to be two very different types of people affected by this bill. The landowners who run businesses on their land undertaking a range of agricultural activity supported by government subsidy and the, the householders who own very modest plots of land and likely have no or little knowledge or interest in land management issues. And I believe this is a key problem in this bill and the process up to today. We have two very differing types of owners, yet the bill attempts a one-size-fits-all approach. My understanding is that 73% of the heritors live on Balgown Estate, therefore I am part of the majority. The valuation amounts under the current Act amount to approximately £20,000 per year. The Balgowan householders were charged £8,100. This is 40% of the total amount. So me and my neighbours make up 73% of the heritors and are charged 40% of the total cost. Yet the balance of power in the bill is retained by a small group of landowners. I would now like to address in detail my objection and reasons for it. The bill details the land which is identified as those which benefit from the power. I believe, I believe there needs to be a complete and detailed reassessment of the benefited lands. This needs to be completed so it is clear who benefits and how they benefit. Only once this is done can the cost of the identified be benefit be calculated. The promoter has state, stated that they consider the original survey of 1846 remains valid in terms of identifying the benefited land. I disagree with this. Uh, there are three very obvious changes since 1846 which have affected the POW, and I'll detail those briefly. Firstly, there have been housing developments in the vicinity of the POW since 1846, with varying degrees of mitigation. For example, the Balgowan housing estate was only constructed after the land was built up. That means the land, the level of land was raised, and the committee would have seen this at the site visit we undertook. The Balgowan houses are obviously higher than the top of the POW bank, and the fields immediately opposite the POW the fields upstream and the fields downstream. Secondly, the agricultural practice has changed radically since 1846 and the benefits of and impacts of the agricultural practice is now very different. For example, intensive ploughing of the fields will have a greater impact on the power and significant volumes of silt entering the power after ploughing takes place. And the third change that has happened is the, is the, since 1846 is the power itself has changed significantly. For example, the lowering of the bed at Dollery Bridge in 1995, and the, and the committee may remember this is the bridge we stopped at during the site visit on the public road, where we looked over the bridge and there was a tremendous drop, much higher than we expected. It was also the location where we had to dodge the cars as they drove over the bridge. You might remember that was certainly ingrained in my memory. The note for the Heritage meeting on the 2nd of March 2015 details the changes to the POW in 18, since 1846, and I quote from that document. The availability of powerful 360-degree excavators has enabled the power to be significantly improved, particularly over the last 25 years. The landscape has changed radically since 1846, and therefore a new assessment is required to see who benefits and how they benefit. And on consideration, I have come to the conclusion that my property has no direct benefit from the POW, and therefore it should be removed from the benefited lands in the bill. I do not have any direct relationship with the POW, and I do not have any direct benefit. Therefore, I believe my property should be removed from the benefited land and I should not be charged. I also believe that there are a number, numerous other properties which also do not have a direct relationship with the POW and should also be removed from the benefited land. 
I do not release anything into the PAL. There is no discharge from my property that goes directly into the PAL. I release no foul drainage into the PAL, and I don't release any surface water into the PAL. I wish to stress this point for the committee. I do not release anything into the PAL, and I have, I believe, no direct relationship with it. Therefore, I ask why am I included, and why am I to be charged? And I appreciate those points may open up for some questions later on, and I'm, I will go, go discuss it later. But I just want to move on, and, I, and I'll continue with expl explaining my objection. <laughs> Uh, in respect of flooding, I believe I do not benefit from any flood protection from the PAL. I have repeatedly made this point, and to date, no evidence or information has been provided to prove me wrong in my assessment. <coughs> in fact, the SEPA flood map sheerly clothes how my house is not considered in a flood risk zone. The Commission has stated over and over again that my house is at risk from flooding, yet have not provided any evidence to support this position. I have reached the conclusion that there is no evidence to support this statement. Therefore, the question remains, why was it said in the first place? To summarise this part of my objection, I believe my home should be removed from the benefit of lands as I do not release anything into the power, nor is my home at risk from flooding. These appear, to be, these appear to be the two benefits identified by the bill, yet they do not affect my house directly. Therefore, I should not be charged, nor should many of my neighbours in both New and Old Balgowan, who equally do not benefit directly. How can I be charged for something I don't do? The second part of my objection I wish to explain relates to funding and specifically a cap on an increase to the annual charge. I wish to say that this is only relevant for me if my property is included in the benefited lands, which, as I've stated out, I don't believe it should be. The second part of my objection, as I said, is on the annual payments. I maintain that a cap should exist to stop significant increases of annual power charges. This has largely fuelled my objection by the balance of power in the bill and how all the power will be reserved to a small group of landowners and, secondly, the lack of transparency over funding and costs. The bill will allow a small group of landowners the ability to increase my annual charge to whatever they see fit without any reference to me. I will have no control over what I will be asked to pay and I will have no ability to review the costs, let alone challenge it, which I believe is fundamentally wrong. I understand that the residents of Balgaon equate to 73% of the heritors, yet we, the majority, will be told what to pay and have to blindly accept this, which I believe is unfair. There appears to be a lack of transparency in the process, and there's no protection against conflicts of interest, and there, are no pro there appears to be no provision for securing the best possible deal for any of the heritors through a fair and open tendering process of the work. Therefore, I'm deeply worried about what charges will be added to my annual bill. I wish to make the point that for landowners and their farm businesses, the power charge is a business expense and therefore will ultimately reduce their tax burden. However, I do not have this luxury, nor can I claim the VAT back, unlike many of the farms, should they be VAT registered. While, this potential, while the potential sums talked about at this stage may be low, in the future there is the potential that the Commission wishes to create a very large reserve of funds and I will have to keep paying. Or they may wish to undertake some very large capital work, such as bank reinforcement, which may be unnecessary and I would have to keep paying. There is no protection for me against the wishes of the landowning commissioners and the desires for their land. I will have to subsidise the landowners for the works on their land, which may or may not be needed, and I would not be able to challenge this. It will be decided amongst the commissioners, who happen to be the farmers who benefit the most. I do not believe this to be fair, and I believe it to be wrong. The bill is highly vulnerable to the whims of future commissioners, who may be, which may be entirely inappropriate and highly expensive, works which cost everyone, but which are not needed. And as I just conclude that my thoughts on that part of my objection, I wish to say that that is not a comment on any of the existing commissioners, just about future proofing. The last point of my objection, the third point, related to previously unpaid bills. And I maintain my view that as the 1846 Act is to be repealed and replaced, calculations under that bill are null and void, and therefore these costs shouldn't be pursued. Uh, Convenia, that concludes my explanation of my objection. And the three key points... Which detail with detail relating to why I objected. Thank you for listening to this point, and obviously I'm happy to, and we'll take questions and be examined on that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I now invite the promoters to pose their questions to Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, can I just check that you have uh, an inventory of papers before you, the one that was circulated a moment ago? Okay, thank you. F firstly, can, can you confirm that you're the owner of uh, 5 Eden Square, Balgowan? 
I can confirm that I am the owner of Five and, and Eden Square, Balgo and Alistair McKee. And I think you, you live there with your, with your family? I do indeed. Thank you. Now, if we could just turn to document uh, number two in the inventory. If you can have that. And in the top left-hand corner, we see that this is a land plan referred to in the POW Bill, and it's entitled Balgowan Houses, Part 1 of 1. Can you see that? Yep, I can, can, see can, that. can you confirm that your property, 5 Eden Square, is within that area uh, coloured purple, or the large area coloured purple? Indeed it is. Right, thank you. And if you could then turn briefly to the next document in your inventory, which is, again, a plan, which is number 3, which shows uh, the, the Balgowan area in a little bit more detail. And can you see um, Eden Square in, in the, almost the sort of the, just off the, off the sort of north centre of that, of that uh, plan? Yep, I'm familiar and, with the location of my house. And can you see a number 35 on that plan? Is that, is that your property? No. No? Uh, number 33. You're number 33, are you, which is... Sorry, is that thirty? Is that thirty? Is that thirty-three? Is it? Yeah. Right. No. Sorry, I yeah. just I, my okay. glasses. I can't see. Okay. So it, the the one you're looking at is is the pink one, which is south of the square. Is that? No, no, no. Uh, the green one north of the square. I don't live in number fifteen. I live in right. number Sorry, five. Right. Sorry, I see. In the green one north of the square. Yeah, Thank that's you. It. That's appreciated. Directly opposite the path. Okay. Okay. Now, turning to uh, page nine, I think, of the agenda papers, if we could have that before us. I think you've got you a copy of the agenda, do you? Yep. Okay. I think you, you say in here that, that when you first moved into 5 Eden Square, you were unaware of the nature of the POW, nor you, were you aware of the requirement to contribute towards its maintenance. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Right. Could you then look at document six in the inventory, please, which is your uh, title deed, or a copy of your title deed. And if you could, that's document six, and if you could turn to page, I think it's page 16 of this document. Do you have that before you, Mr Davis? Page 16 of 23. That's correct, yes. And if you could go to about one, two, three, four, five lines up, uh, it starts with 11 and then it says drainage all plots. Do you see that? Struggling to identify that just at the moment. Yeah, so it's page 16, one, two, three, four, five lines up from the bottom. Oh yeah, point yeah. 11. Right, you see 11. Could you just read that, that uh, sentence, please? Uh, for the benefit of everyone here, I'll read it for it. Yep. Drainage, all plots shall jointly pay an equal one fifty-fourth share of the annual drainage levy due to the power of and Chaffee drainage conditions in relation to the use of the power of and Chaffee for the drainage of the development. Do you wish me to go on or shall I stop there? Uh, just, just continue for a bit, yes, for that. If, and to the extent required by the proprietor of the development immunity ground, payments shall be made to the proprietor of the development immunity ground who will then collect and forward such payments to the power of and Chaffee drainage commissioners. Right. Just pause there. So, so I think your position initially was that you were unaware of the nature of the POW nor the requirement to contribute yeah. towards its maintenance. Indeed. Now, may, may we agree that that specific charge was included in your title deeds when you bought your property? Um, yeah, I, I acknowledge that and I've never disagreed with the fact that it may well be in my title deeds. Uh, how, how is it then that you, you were unaware of it if it's in your title deeds? I think that would be a discussion between my, me and the, my solicitor at the time who, who was uh, uh, acting for me when I onto the property because I, I didn't read my title deeds and you could not may state that that was a mistake on my behalf however I trusted my legal representative to do that for me it wasn't alerted to me at the time um, I wasn't aware of it until I received the first bill mm -hmm. and when, when when you bought your property it was never disclosed to you by the previous owner well I was the first owner of the property you were the first owner of the property were you? right Okay. And I distinctly remember a discussion with a vendor. I asked specifically if there's any annual charges. I expect they thought it related to maintenance charges, or a, but there was, it was never um, identified to me okay. at that point. Now, two, two points just in, in terms of the paragraph you've read out. May, may, may we agree that the reference for the charge, what the charge is for, is for drainage. It does use the word drainage. Okay? Because I know you've made some statements about flooding, but can we agree that this 
charge per your title deed is about drainage? There are statements made about flooding, but they weren't in made by me in the first place. They were made by the Commission. Right. I, I, I'm less interested in, and we can actually go to that later, okay. but I'm just, okay. for the purposes of this title deed, may we agree that the reference in terms of the charge being made by the, the, the commissioners on your property it relates to drainage? I would not dispute what it says in, right. the, in, the, okay. in, the, in the deeds. Thank you. May, may we also agree that there's, there's no statement of any cap being placed on that charge in your title deed? The deeds are clear for everyone to see. It doesn't appear there's a statement of a cap. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> so when, when did you become aware of the, the, the charge, Mr Davis? I don't recollect a spe specific date, Mr McKee, but I would imagine it was around about the time I received the first bill, which I would understand would be when I moved in in July 20, 2010, probably uh, midpoint 2011. I don't recollect the exact date. Do, do you recollect what, what the charge was, what, how, mu how much the charge was for? Uh, no. Right. If I advise you that it was £150, would that jog your memory at all? That, yes, of course, it was different VAT rate then, so it was probably about 175 inclusive of VAT. Okay. Now, have you, have you been paying the, 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 the annual charge? I have paid some, but not all. Right. How, how much have you paid towards the...? I, I don't recollect the figure of my exact payment. Now, for, from, from the records I, I've established from the Commissioner's solicitors, McCash and Hunter, they show that you are £620 in arrears on your annual charge of £150 plus VAT. They say that you paid £100 towards the, the 2016 assessment, but, has, but he has not paid in the years 2014, 2015 or 2017. Is that, might that be correct? That might be correct. Okay. Now, you, your, your written evidence is that you've come to understand the nature of the POW, why it's needed, and you accept that there should be a charge for it. G given, given that you accept that and you accept obviously the principle of paying what why have you not contributed any further sums i've not contributed uh, well firstly i went to two, two points into your comment mr mckee firstly i don't uh, i've come to a different conclusion following the original submission of my objection that my p property benefits from drainage i don't believe that to be the case that i don't believe it directly benefits from drainage uh, and this reason for not paying is set out in my objection that i have objected for exactly the same reasons as, as i have chosen not to pay at times because I don't believe that it's fair, proportionate, evidence-based, mm -hmm. well, and I don't believe I have any direct. I now don't believe I have any direct uh, relationship with the PAL. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, just, just sort of staying with the theme of of, of how much this might charge, might might cost you, and what the annual charges would be. Could, could you now have a look at document four, which is. Uh, a schedule which the commissioners have supplied to the Parliament is on the Parliament's website. And if, if we look down the, the property, uh, down to number 33, which is your property, that's 5 Eden Square. That, that's, that's correct, isn't it? Yep, that's where I live. Now, just looking across to what the new assessment would be for your property, this is on the basis of a sort of averaged out £20,000 annual assessment. We see that your charge would be £16.90. Can you see that? I can see that. Do you have any comment to make upon that? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any of these figures, and nor have I seen evaluation because that wasn't included in the original uh, notes relating to the submission of the bill earlier this year. But I, I appreciate this may come of news, this news to you, but this has been on the Parliament's website for, for some time and it's information which the commissioners have been giving to the, the committee. But I think your position is you haven't... Well, this, web, this, this spreadsheet... This spreadsheet, on. yes. Well, I was unaware of that, but thank you for pointing it out to me, Mr McKean. Okay. Okay. Now, if you look at the next schedule, which is document five, and if we do the same exercise, and we look down at uh, property number 33, which is 5 Eden Square... We see the, and this again is based on a £20,000 annual assessment, we see um, a, a draft new assessment on your property of £51.51. .51. Now, I'll maybe just explain that the, the, the commissioners have actually carried out a, a further exercise to smooth out the potential effects of properties which have a relatively large garden to house size. 
So they've put this through a multiplier, but under the new, under this new kind of method of assessment for a £20,000 annual charge, your uh, annual charge comes out at £51.43. Now, what, what's, your, what's your reaction to that compared to your current charge, which, which is being levied against you? Appreciate you haven't paid it for 150 Well, they're two very different amounts. Uh -huh. And I presume these are charges based... But these are charges based upon the current assessment of the requirements of the POW. They are based upon the, the assessments under the POW bill, yes. Yes, so the requirement for current work under the POW. Yes. That, well, that, that's helpful to know. Thank you for bring, bringing that to my attention. Mr. But I, I'm just interested to, to, in your reaction. I mean, you, you're up at 150 under the old arrangements, shall we say. You, didn't, you don't agree with them. But under the new arrangement, you're, you're at £51. The... Yeah, yeah, I can acknowledge those figures. I mean, I, I haven't done the calculations. I'm not aware of how those cal calculations have come about, and I don't know what the methodology behind them is, nor do I know the assessments of the methodology. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I, I'm, I'm being advised that the calculations are obviously on, on the chart, but I appreciate you may not have had time to, to look at that if it's the first time you've looked at it. OK. So can, 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 can we agree that you're, you're arguably getting something of a bargain from what your previous position was at 150 to your position going forward at 51 pounds. The, the point of my objection is not necessarily about the money. Okay. It's actually about the point of principle. Okay. Right. Well, let, 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 let's let's turn to some of these principles. Um, I think the you, you will know that the promoter has stated in evidence, both orally and in writing, that the basis for identifying benefited land. Uh, in the POW is the original survey prepared in 1846, and I think your position is um, you 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 want a, a reassessment done because you you either don't you, you don't trust it, you don't rely upon it. No, I, I don't believe I bear I have any direct relationship with the POW. Okay, that's why I don't I believe well, a reassessment should be required. Okay, well let, let let let's see if you do. If you could turn to document eight in the inventory which is a copy of the original survey plan that, that accompanied the 1846 Act. If you can open that plan out, it's of some, some length. So, yeah, if you yeah. open it out fully, because I think, I think it's actually the last unfolding that we have the, the Balgowan section. OK. And can you see where there's a, there's a, red, a red arrow? Yep, I can spot that. That was put on by me. Okay. Now, immediately above that, may we agree that that area showing a series of enclosures is Balgowan? Uh, it's not possible to identify detail because this is neither an um, upstate map or it doesn't have any geo-references references on it. So I'd have to assume that that might be the case, but I have no... There's, there's no detail here to suggest that this is the location. But it, it, I take your word for it that it is. Well, we, we can take evidence from, from uh, Mr Guest on that if you, if you dispute it. I don't but, dispute but, it, but I just point out that it's not actually easy to identify exactly where Balgowan is on this map. Well, if, if, you, if you go back uh, to document number two... <laughs> hmm. ..which is the parliamentary plans which were derived from this original survey plan. I'm putting to you, Mr Davis, that that Balgowan area is the area which is indicated by that arrow. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't... It's not... Well, well, what is that arrow indicating? I don't want to make it be a point of difficult, because I think it's just perhaps just not helpful, but it, it doesn't... It's not clear exactly where Balgowan is on this map. Right. But we'll have to take that in, in evidence in chief from, from, from Mr. Um, Mr. Guest. Now, if, if one assumes that the 1862, 18, 1846 um, original plan was accurate and it was used for the purposes of an act of parliament, what, why, why should the commissioners go to the very significant cost an expense of undertaking a reassessment. Mapping has changed something of quite significantly since 1846, and the accuracy of maps uh, has changed quite significantly since 1846. So, um, uh, I, th I had to question whether this map is indeed accurate and where the location of Balgowan is on this map. 
That said, if we assume that your orange uh, red uh, arrow is the north southwest corner of Balgowan, then uh, it would appear Balgowan sits sits somewhere in that area. However, my point, which I made earlier on, is that when the uh, houses were constructed, there was mitigation associated with the development of that property, mm -hmm. and the land was built up. Therefore, the land wasn't the houses weren't built directly onto this assumed location, but actually the land was was changed. Okay. Uh, so my point is that the uh, as a reassessment of the land is required because since 1846 there have been three very significant changes. One of which is the mitigation associated with the housing development of Balgowan. Mm -hmm. But w would you agree with me that the, the most significant change has been the introduction of housing? in this area, particularly around the, the, the Balgaven area? I think there's been a number of changes and I wouldn't like to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to identify which is the most significant. Mm -hmm. Now, you, 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 you're saying that you're, you're, you, the land in which, or the land platform on which the, your development has been built was raised. May we still agree that, that, that the surface water drainage from that whole development still flows into the POW? I don't know. You don't know? No. Well, that is the position of the promoter that it does. It is actually at a higher level than the POW, isn't it? Um, I, when the surface water drainage leaves my property, it goes on to someone else's ownership, and I don't know what happens with it thereafter. OK. We'll, we'll have to agree to disagree. Uh, may we agree that there is a waterworks which has been built for serving your development? Indeed, there has been. OK. May we agree that that waterworks ultimately outfalls into... The POW? I don't know. I don't know where the... All I know is that it leaves my property and then it goes into someone else's ownership. OK. Well, if, if, if we assume that your uh, surface water drainage and your outfall from your sewerage system flows ultimately in the, into the POW, might we agree that you are benefited by the POW? I don't believe I have any direct relationship with the POW, nor any direct benefit. So well, I don't... I'm well, sorry if, to say I don't agree on that but point. If, if, if your property drains directly into the POW and your sewerage system, we know it exists, I think politicians have seen it, but they came to look at it, and I think you were on the site visit, that drains into the POW, then, then is it not the case that you are living on land which is benefited by the POW? Who owns the sewerage system? Well, are you going to, you, you tell I, me. I, 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 don't, I don't own the sewerage system. Well, it's a, I believe it's in private ownership, isn't it? Uh, I, I understand it's owned by Bet Homes, who, were the, who took on Manor Kingdom, who was the previous builder of my property. Uh, the sewerage and drainage leaves my property, and thereafter it goes into the community sewerage system and a drainage. I, I don't know any detail about that. Mm -hmm. It then goes on to the ownership of someone, into the property of someone else. I do not know what they do with it. I do not know how they treat it. I do not know where it goes. And therefore... I, I don't have any direct relationship with the power. Okay, right. You, you, you don't know the answer to the question, but can, can we agree that at least when your title deed was being prepared, those who drafted it were aware that you did receive some drainage benefits from the POW because it's in your title deeds. It's maybe in my title deeds and, and in accordance with the 1846 Act. However, we're moving on. That's going to be repealed and we're moving on to a new Act. And therefore, I think it's appropriate to consider what the points I would be under the new Act, and, and therefore I'm raising my objection. I, I, the water leaves my property, foul water drainage, and it goes elsewhere. It doesn't go directly into the power. I don't know where it goes. I assume it goes into well, the drainage let, network. Let, let, and I let's, assume let's just, for the sake of it, assume it goes indirectly into the power. You're still receiving a benefit from the power, aren't you? I think the important point is, the detail of this is quite, is quite critical to my, hence my statement at the beginning of my objection. I do not own the sewerage works. I do not release anything into the power. Yeah, but you, you're, you're releasing something into the waterworks, which no, no. then goes into the power. Yes, but I don't. I, it's not up to me when it's released into the power or who it's released into the power. For all I know, they put it in tankers and take it away. I don't know what happens with it. It goes into the treatment works, and then I, 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 it's, it's entirely up to the owner. I don't own the treatment works, therefore I have no control over what happens when it goes to the treatment works and what happens to it afterwards. So I have no direct relationship with the power on that basis. Well, when the, when the water lands in your garden, on your roof, the, the surface water runs off your house, um, it's at a higher level than the POW. Is it reasonable to assume that it ends up in the POW? I own 192 square metres of, uh, of land. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a small garden at the back of my property, which, um, excuse me, I'll just find my notes for this so I can explain my thinking on this. Let's see, I own 192 square metres. 
that's uh, 0.1992 of a hectare, 0.47 acres. Mr. Uh, Joe and Hugh obviously own significant amounts more, as do any all, all the farmers. Part of that is my garden, probably 20 to 30, 40 square metres maybe. Uh, a lot of the water will be dealt with through interception and transpiration of the plants in the garden. And then the water that drains from the roof into the drainage and the gutters into the drainage soak away, goes into the communal drainage system. It then leaves my property and I don't know where it goes. I can only assume it goes into a communal drainage or sewerage system, but I have no control over what happens to it once it leaves my property. So what, what do you think would happen, for example, if, 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 if the waterworks does have a dependency on the, the POW, uh, the surface water drainage from your property does have a dependence on the POW, what happens if the, if the commissioners stopped maintaining the POW and there was a problem? that in, in some way meant that you couldn't, you couldn't, the surface water wouldn't drain from your property, the sewage system wouldn't work. Wouldn't you want that to be repaired? Don't you have a dependency on the commissioners? M my, what, the water releases from my house goes into these the systems under other uh, organisations or people's ownership. I would imagine those who choose to release water into the POW would want to take that up with the commission. But as I don't release anything into the POW, I don't have any direct relationship with the POW, nor do I have any, have any direct relationship but, but, with the commissioners. Come along, Mr. Mr. Davis, you have a direct contractual relationship because it's in your title deeds. I think it's important to get to the detail of what actually happens, which I appreciate you're wanting to do, Mr. I don't dispute that. Um, when the water leaves my property, it goes into the foul water, goes into the sewage works, which is owned by Bet Homes. And then I presume, and I don't know, but I presume it goes into the POW. But as I said, I don't release it into the POW nor do I have any control over it to be released in the power, and it isn't even in my power or ownership. So I would question whether there's a legal point on how I could possibly be charged for something I don't have any control over, nor do I have any power well, over. Our position is that you are quite clearly a directly benefited person, Mr Davis, and I think we can agree, we're disagreeing on quite a lot, we can agree, can we not, that there is a direct contractual relationship in your title deed requiring you to pay a 154th share for the drainage into the power. Under the 1846 Act and the benefited lands identified, yes. However, we're moving on to a new Act with, and I'm calling for, an, uh, through this process, I'm objecting on the basis that the benefited lands need to be re-identified because I argue I do not directly benefit from well, the power. We'll, we'll need to choose to, to, to disagree. If, if, if we can move on to the, the, the points about flood alleviation, and I think you've made some big points about this, about what, what, what is it that the POW does, if anything, for yep. you? And you said, well, it's definitely not um, flood alleviation. And on that basis, could, could you perhaps look at the uh, document one, the POW bill itself, please? Which is document one, POW bill. If you could turn to uh, section 27. Yep which is uh, on page nine. Okay. Now, if we, if we move down there, down to the definition, to the definition of benefited land, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and may we agree that it says that it's land drained by the POW shown on the, the, the colored plans, which is the parliamentary plans. Yep. So on, on that basis, can, can we agree that the purpose of the POW bill in terms, of, in terms of benefited land is to ensure drainage, not flood alleviation. Although I agree with you, perhaps, that flood alleviation may be indirectly related to effective drainage, obviously. Is that a concession on the part of the commissioners that it's not flood alleviation? In, in, certain, in, certain, asp in certain parts of the the benefited land, there is some flood alleviation because drainage and flooding are also a related concept. Yeah, yeah. But for the purposes of the charging system under the old Act, the 1846 Act, and this Act, may we agree that the bill is about drainage, it's about maintaining effective drainage? So for my property, if, it, if there was any direct, which I disagree there isn't, is it, are you stating, Mr McKee, that it's drainage and not flooding? I, th I think for the purposes of your property, I think it fulfills a drainage function. It, well, may, it may ultimately fulfil a flooding function if, for example, the, 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 
the, the, the POW did not flow, there may be flooding. I, I, you know, over what period, I do not know. Yeah. Well, but, I, it's, I, but it's, sorry. I think its primary function in as, insofar as your property is concerned is, is drainage. Well, I, I, would, I would thank you for making that concession and acknowledging that uh, it is drainage. I would ask the question... Oh, um, the, sorry, Mr Davis, it's not, it's not a concession. It's what the Act actually says. I'm not... The Act, the Act is not called the, the Power of Chaffrey um, Flood Flood Alleviation Commission Bill. It's the, it's the Power of Chaffrey Drainage uh, th Commission. Th thank you for that clarification. Can I make a point just on, on that, which may be helpful for the committee also? On the 13th of January 2015, I received a letter from Akash and Hunter, and I will quote, it says, The Power Commission is charged as levy for the purpose of ensuring that the power burn is cleared and dredged so as to prevent flooding of the lands in this area. Inspections are periodically carried out and the maintenance works of the power and its banks are carried out each year so that the full length of the power of Inchaffery continues to flow unobstructed. Your property benefits from these works in the absence of which it would be a risk of flooding and possible uninsurability. Excuse me whilst I just identify my papers. On the, for the note for the Heritage Meeting of Gas Call, 6th of, uh, 6 p.m. on 2nd of March 2015, a, a note was prepared and given to all the Heritors. On page one, it says, The Commission's role in pre preventing the floods which have blighted the low lying land in Strathurn for centuries means that the land is drained. The land drained is among the most fertile agricultural acreage in Scotland. In addition, the Commission's work has made residential, pro residential development possible in some areas, such as the former Balgan sawmill site. It is therefore vitally important that the POW is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. And in the promoter's memorandum, though that uh, sentence is used again, it is therefore vitally important that, it's, that the POW is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. And in the, the consultation paper in May 2016, again, that exact sentence, it is therefore vitally important that the power is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. If flooding isn't the issue, why has it been repeatedly stated that it is vitally important to prevent flooding of my house? That, that's a question you'll need to put to um, the promoter when they come to give evidence. I'm asking the questions just now, but, but you know, I, I think we can agree that uh, from what I've said, these words could have been better chosen in correspondence uh, with you. Um, I mean, d j just, I, just... I will, I will just, come back to that point. Just, better just, chosen just, is an interesting uh, statement of words. Better but, chosen, I, I would perhaps use another word which I'll come on to when I ask the question. OK. Well, the, the, the reason I say better chosen is because we, we, have, we have agreed, have we not, that there is a relationship between drainage and flooding. And if you don't drain, you could flood. But there's also, you know, you, you, as, a, as a matter of fact, residential properties need to be able to drain both surface water drainage and foul water drainage. If that drainage cannot happen at some future point and it cannot drain, there will be a flood or the higher propensity to flood. I think it's important to have a proper hydrological assessment of the catchment to identify the risks. Now, I think I think your next your next big point I have noted is that is that you you you're concerned about perhaps not the current commissioners but future commissioners uh, setting budgets at a level which which you don't agree with, and you 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 want to impose some form of cap or limitation uh, upon that. Um, I mean, just just come back to the point that that. If, if we are correct and you're not correct, we are correct that your property does benefit from the POW, and if the POW were not to be maintained, you would suffer some deleterious uh, effects, not least um, you, you couldn't um, outfall the sewage from the, from the waterworks and surface water drainage wouldn't operate. Would that not then have the effect of sort of reducing the value of your property? Wouldn't you want the commissioners to have the freedom to do works that are needed solely, and I, I stress the word solely, to maintain effective drainage? Well, yeah, I'll answer your question, Mr McKee. I, I, as I said earlier on, I do not believe my property has any direct uh, relationship with the POW and well, should be well, removed can, from can, the benefit. Well, but let's no, just, no, 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 can we just be a bit hypothetical finish, you, here? Mr. Because McKee. you can't answer the question by saying, uh, in, in fairness, that you're totally disagreeing. But if we can just, if you can just humour me and on the basis that your property is benefited by the POW, and then maybe you could just answer the question whether yeah. you'd like the commissioners it, it, to maintain the in, duty. In the theoretical, on the theoretical point that my property does benefit directly, and I don't believe it does, then uh, the commission has a duty to undertake works to maintain the power. However, 
I do not believe that the current arrangements, so maybe I've misunderstood the bill and I would uh, you know, be happy to receive further clarification of that, but I do not believe the current bill provides the necessary protection in place to ensure that unaffordable increases are unilaterally added to uh, bills associated for, for me, my neighbours and any other heritor. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. I mean, I think, I think you, you've got a sort of developed point on that. You also mentioned in your letter of objection that you have concerns that the commissioners may also sort of build up a financial reserve. And is that, is that, is that a, that's probably a related point, is it not, to... Yeah, it, it, it's, to, it's to, relating to, to potential finan financial res uh, um, the reserve in the event of un um, unexpected expenditure, uh, the beaver gate, which has been talked about, but also uh, future proofing. What happens if a commissioner... What happens if... For example, all the farms are amalgamated and, and it's all owned by one particular ownership, and that farmer then chooses to uh, do un, in, un, unrequired works all along the length of the power, yeah. which would have to be paid for significantly by the residents of Balgaon, who again make up 73% of the heritors. So yeah. I believe there needs to be some mechanism in place to identify transparency, resolution of the conflict of interest, to ensure that there is a free and open tendering process over the work and some form, some mechanism which may, which would allow for controlling the expenditure. Okay, right. Just, just dealing briefly with the, with the, um, the, the financial reserve point, w w would you agree with me that, that as, a, as a sort of matter of prudent measure uh, to, un to address unforeseen circumstances, it, it's, it's sort of reasonable for the Commission in their duties to have this opportunity of, of a financial reserve for exceptional circumstances? If you're budgeting for the maintenance of any piece of ground, it is appropriate to be able to call on reserves to deal with uh, emergencies. Okay, thank you. So if we could go to back to document one, please. If you could look at uh, schedule one on page 10. You, can you see that it's actually got um, it's actually setting out the functions of the of the commission? Can you see that? Uh, sorry, I, which, it's, it's oh yeah, sorry, page yeah, ten. Yeah, yeah. So you, what 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 you're concerned about in your uh, lengthy answer to my question was the the transparency about this possibility of an amalgamation of a large farm and they're choosing to do something which you ultimately have to pay for, and and you're worried about about levels of control. May may we agree? that in terms of the statutory functions which the Commission would have if the Act is passed, and if we go down to underneath C here, they've got to do a number of things. They can only maintain, repair and renew the POW, um, take out the weeds in, uh, and, on affected land, carry out improvements in protective works, but only insofar as the Commission considers it, considers it necessary or desirable to maintain effective drainage of the benefited land. Now, can we agree that that does place a limitation <coughs> on what the commissioners can authorise. It has to be within these statutory duties. If it's not for effective drainage, then they, can't, they shouldn't be doing it. They can't do it. Uh, uh, within those duties conferred on, through, the, through the bill, I would see there be an opportunity to interpret the requirements of the power, not to interpret the, the, the legislation itself, but interpret what actually is required. Okay. So, for example, what happens if an owner decided to put um, to reinforce the bank the entire length of their ownership? Well, uh, as I understand it, such work has been undertaken already. Mm -hmm. But, but won't, won't the if that is the case, but the commissioners would have to pay for that as well, and they're trying to keep the cost down, are they not? Is there a mechanism in the bill for the commissioners to keep the cost down? There's not a statutory cap. No. That's my point. Okay. Can we can we just turn to um, document seven in your uh, list there, the, the the tax banding. <laughs> now, what what this is, uh, Mr. Davis, is th th this is this is what's published by your local authority, Perth and Kinross Council, and it talks about, it breaks down what the council tax banding is for particular values of property and what the individual charges are. And if you go to the, the, the page one to begin with, 
we see in there on the penultimate column at the bottom of the page a wastewater charge. Can you see that? Yep, yep, I've got that. Then, it's, unfortunately, it needs to go over the page yep. here, but it, the column starts at £154.20. And if we move down there, it talks about you know the, the, the value of the properties, uh, and if, so if you, if, you can, if you continue on, it's talking about the charges for the next year. It's maybe easier to see that. Um, but the, the the charges, say for example, for a, for a you know for a, a property, I'm told might be in the sort of um, say it's within the sort of C to F range. It means that if if you had uh, an adopted um, sewerage system rather than a private system, okay. Uh, might we agree that you would be paying council tax to the order of two hundred pounds plus uh, to the council? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. right. And under the current arrangements, uh, on a twenty thousand with the five multiply, you'd be paying fifty one pounds for that. Uh, my understand, so yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. My understanding is is that in time the sewage system will be adopted by Scottish Water and the local authority. Therefore, it is. It's, I will be paying that at some point in the future. It is. It has not been adopted. I don't know the details why. I've been. It's been indicated to me that maybe it's not up to standard. I, I don't know genuinely. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand that I will be paying that at some point when it is adopted yeah. by. But, but at the moment, Wood. it is. It is an unadopted private system, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So just, just, just purely financially, with with the. An assessment at twenty thousand pounds at fifty-one pounds. Um, perhaps it, 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 the the local authority may charge a lot more. And you you may well know that the the commissioners did approach Perth and Kinross Council, asking them to look after the POW, mm. and they they refused. And as, as did Scottish Water, yeah. SEPA, and all the rest of it. So that's the situation we were left with. But sort of balancing the fifty-one pounds roughly against two hundred plus, it, 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 that's not an unreasonable state of affairs you're in. Just now, is it? Uh, no, no. You say it's okay. 150 pounds difference. Okay. Um, I, I would just say, though, that at some point I will be charged for the if the, the system is adopted, I'll have to be charged that. And secondly, um, within the um, the bill, my concern is I, I can't see any mechanism mechanism to stop that being increased to 200, 250, 300 on an annual basis. Should the commissioner see fit to do so? Okay. So ju just on that specific point, are, are you aware that the commissioners wrote to the Scottish Parliament on the, I think it was on the 11th of October, uh, setting out a possible amendment to give a right of appeal to heritors uh, in respect of the, of the annual assessment. I, I am aware, I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily understand okay. all the detail, but I am aware that there was um, an, a right of appeal which was identified. Yeah, could, can I maybe just explain a little bit yeah. about the appeal and then we can we can Absolutely. just ex explore your views. I mean, what what, what, the, what the right of appeal uh, concerned was, if 10 or more heritors, and I, I stress that because this is an important point in it, if 10 or more heritors wish to challenge the annual assessment in any given year, or the draft budget, however you describe it, it would be the draft budget because it's before the annual assessment is raised. So if, if 10 or more heritors wish to do that, then they can then have that budget assessed by an independent expert at no cost to themselves, okay, directly. There's no fee for making the appeal. Now, one, one, of, the, one of the concerns in, in giving this right, and why, why, it's, why it's been resisted by the commissioners, uh, has been the potential costs that that right of appeal might impact on all of the other heritors. Because if there's a right of appeal exercised and it has to go to an independent expert, then the cost of that independent expert required to be paid by the Commission itself. And the Commission have no other source of income other than the annual assessment. So if, if it was just one person, one heritor appealing, then all of the rest of the heritors would have to pay for that appeal. And in the calculations we've, we've made and, and, and given the, uh, the committee, the, the fear of the Commission is that Say, for example, the cost of the appeal could run into a few thousand pounds. The the actual e e even if the even if the independent expert upholds the appeal and said the the, the the budget's too high, everyone needs to get you know fifty pounds or twenty pounds less. It's still going to be a higher annual assessment because the costs of that appeal need to be borne by the finite pool of 
inheritors that we have. But be that as it may, that really explains why it's why we've got this threshold of 10. It's to stop someone who simply is just doing it for the, you know, because they want to do it. We've put this threshold of 10. And I'm, I'm just really interested in exploring what your view is of, the, of, that, of that right of appeal, right of review. Thank and, 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 yeah. Thank you, for Thank you for explaining it. That, that was my understanding, having read it. Um, it was inter it's interesting how to provide some provision for the abil ability to review the cost, it went straight into, a, um, into an appeal process. I think there's other parts of the process that need to be identified, not straight into an adversarial approach. Firstly, um, it, transparency about the actual costs of the maintenance. Secondly, uh, an open and fair tendering process of the works. So I come to you know I come yeah. to your point, and I just feel it's a much bigger thing that's needed, a much bigger yeah. explanation, much bigger provision that's needed, not just the right. Oh right, you can appeal it straight into adversarial. You know, you can appeal it. And secondly, what are you actually appealing? Were well, you appealing the assessment of the cost of the works? You don't have a right to appeal the actual requirement of the works. Nor do you have a right to appeal the actual tendering process of those works. So, that, so it actually just directs the appeal to a very narrow part of the overall picture. And I, I think it needs to be much broader. One of the issues that was raised in the very first heritage meetings that I attended, probably back in 2015, um, there was a, a, sort of a, a, a real sense, and uh, this is my view, and uh, perhaps Joe and you would may disagree, but that of wanting to know what this was all about. What, why were we being charged? What was the POW? What were the what what were the what what were the costs associated with, and it and it's not just oh you can appeal the actual assessment of the cost of those works that's quite a narrow part of the overall picture it needs to be much broader than that, than just saying you could because if if a, if a contractor states that it will cost me X to dig the pal, and we say I have, I don't think it will cost you X I appeal it, then obviously there's a cost who we've got to get an expert who's going to be the expert. Well, the, the, the expert is going to be appointed by the, I think it's the Association of Drainage um, Authorities. Okay, so that's... But that's because we're looking yeah. for an expert, you know, yeah. who would be a surveyor, I would imagine. So, so what, what are we just appealing? Because I, I, I think the likelihood is there wouldn't be a substantial difference in the um, appeal. There may not be a substantial difference in the actual cost of the digging. My point is, is it actually needed? And is there thorough and proper explanation to demonstrate that it is actually needed? So I think, although it's welcomed that there's a right of appeal, it's a much bigger picture that needs to, to be inclusive of all the heritors so they can understand why it's being dug, the costs. There is a fair tendering process to get best value for the heritors, as well as the ability to veto the actual, uh, to actually um, have, an, have some sort of mechanism to um, challenge the the rate, the, the, the rate. but it, it, just just saying it's on the on the on that one point is, is a narrow narrow point. Well, you, you you say it's a narrow ground of appeal, but but the, I I have to say I, do, I don't agree with you because the the independent expert would always be looking at the budget, be looking at the work, be looking at the the, the costs for that work. Is uh, that all detailed in the in the concession in the, re the more recent submission? Yes. So they will be looking at the requirement for the work. Well, uh, sorry, I, they, they are, they, it, is, it is a right of appeal to an expert, and I, I'm assuming that he's, he is looking at all of these matters. Yes. I mean, he, 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 need, he or she needs to form a view as to whether the annual budget is, is reasonable, uh, it is within the, the terms of the Act, because we know that the duty of the commissioners, the function of the commissioners, is, is effective drainage. If it's not being, if the money isn't being used for effective drainage, then he, he or she is, I would think, would likely to say you can't charge that. Well, well that's an, ass an assumption based upon what's provided. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that. It, it, I think that perhaps more detail needs to be included for me to fully understand it, because as I can see it, it's just an appeal on the cost of the actual pr of the works, rather than, well, is it required? Full stop. No, no. I, I can assure you, the appeal goes beyond merely looking at cost. It's, it's not just saying. You, I mean, an appellant wouldn't be saying this is just far too much. They have to say it's too much because you know th th these items shouldn't be included. For example, and it would be for the independent expert to, to, to look at that, look at all of the issues and around and, and make make a view. And does it does it say that? Well, we we haven't actually formally drafted the 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 sort of right of appeal, and, and it's only a suggestion at the moment. But okay. we are we are, you know, well, we, we are negotiating on that point at the yeah, moment. But yeah. I can see I can see what you want. But I can see that that I mean, c can I record that that. And I don't want to sort of record it wrongly, but that you you broadly welcome such a right. 
there needs to be further provisions in the bill to uh, to protect all the heritors from unaffordable increases and to create transparency to secure best value for money and protection of conflict of interest. Okay. And I don't I, I welcome what you've proposed, but I don't think it goes that far. Okay. You'd like it to go further? Much further. Right. I have no further questions. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. McKee. Thank you. Thank very you, much, Mr. Mr. Davis. Davis, we will suspend briefly for a five minute comfort break.
Thank you. Um, I now wish to invite the promoters to set out their views. Thank you, the, the promoter stands by the evidence already given to the committee, orally and in writing. Uh, in particular, the promoter relies upon its responses to all of the three objections made to the POW bill and the written representations, all are set out in, uh, in, in the letter on its behalf, uh, dated 6 December 2017, to the committee clerk, uh, which has been in encapsulated into the committee papers. And may I respectfully request that the committee take that as read. And I can just develop really four points uh, before uh, we move to questioning. The, the, the first of these, uh, and I've just got sort of headings for these, is the drainage function of the POW. The, the principal function of the POW, and indeed the 1846 Act, relates to maintaining effective drainage. The function of the commissioners, following that of the 1846 Act, is to maintain effective drainage. And that's Schedule 1 of 1, and it's not, it's not specifically about flooding, although flooding is, as I've pointed out, not indirectly or indirect, is indirectly related uh, to effective drainage. Whilst the consequence of effective drainage may be in certain areas of benefited land to alleviate flooding, again, the central purpose of the POW bill relates to drainage. Benefited land, as defined in terms of Section 27 of the POW bill, is land drained by the POW as shown on the parliamentary plans. The second point I wish to uh, advance is really the reasons why a, a reassessment in the sense of a resurvey is not required. In my questioning of Mr Davis, I've indicated why a reassessment is not needed. The promoter has stated in evidence, both orally and in writing, that the basis for identifying the benefited land in the POW bill is the original survey plan prepared for the 1846 Act. The promoter believes that the original survey plan, which was prepared in relation to the, the Act, uh, identifies benefited land and remains accurate, and in the promoter's view, there is no evidence to the contrary. The promoter in preparing the parliamentary plans for the POW bill has examined the enclosures and fields shown on the benefited land land on the 1846 plan and transferred these uh, faithfully onto the parliamentary plans. Now, because of this, uh, in promoter's view, there is no reasonable basis for any reassessment of benefited land to be undertaken, nor is it necessary. Now, on that point, if I could just pass over to Mr Guest and ask him, as the author of the parliamentary plans and someone who is interpreting the original survey plan, just to explain what he did. I thought that would be helpful. So if we could again have... Uh, before us uh, the survey plan which is uh, number eight of the promoters papers and if we could open that up again to where the, the 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 pink arrow is shown and i should say i put the pink arrow on that isn't on the original plan i just did that for for ease of reference for today and i i could perhaps just uh, invite mr guest to explain uh, his understanding of in what way the Balgowan area specifically, because that's what we've been dealing with today, is benefited land uh, in terms of the, the 1846 plan, why that plan is reliable and how he then transferred the identification of the benefited fields and enclosures onto the parliamentary plans. So, Mr Guest, if you could sure. help, I would be grateful. Well, the 1846 survey shows the... Press the press button. button. Press button. Sorry, no. that's it. Sorry, it's on, it's on. It's on. The 1846 survey shows the power and the side ditches, and it also shows the enclosures which comprise the benefited land. And um, whilst I appreciate that uh, this plan was prepared, I think the Ordnance Survey plan started about 1870, so it's not much before. Um, um, it, it, it does show, it, it, it shows the enclosures of the benefited land. And if you look at the Balgowan plan, the Balgowan area where Alistair's red arrow is, you can see the main power, you can see the Backleton power, you can see the Jesse Byrne, which is the one going north towards the north point, and you can see the Cow Gask, which is the uh, side ditch running southwards, and you can see that double line, which is obviously the, the, the road, um, which we drove along during the inspection, and you can see that the enclosures between the road and the, and the power are uh, shown as benefited land. So when we were doing the 
when we prepared the plans which uh, in, in support of the present bill, what we did was we looked at this 1846 survey, and I've got a larger version of this back in the office. Um, we looked at that, and then we transcribed as accurately as we could the the you know, the benefited land as shown on on here onto modern ordnance survey vector data. Um, we then analysed the uh, on the on, an, on the agricultural side. Um, it's classified according to I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but the, there's the Macaulay Institute, which is this thing. All, all the land and all the agricultural land in Scotland has been classified by the Macaulay Institute into the different grades, and there are maps here which show um, where the different grades are. We transcribe those onto the new plan, and then with digital mapping, it's very simple to work out the areas of the different categories of land and different areas. It's actually the approach we took. Um, and then we took the, took the values for each for, uh, per acre for the different classif land classifications, whether it was the different, the different types of grades of agricultural land, forestry land, residential land, and commercial property land. And we, and we applied those to the areas which had been worked out off these digital plans. That's how we did it. That, that's very helpful. Could, could you also maybe just explain what your understanding is of any key changes that may have occurred in this area? Uh, I, don't, since I, the I, don't believe, I don't believe that the levels of the land have changed at all. You know, uh, the, the topography of the land is the same as it always was. Um, there have been changes in the, uh, in, in the bed level of the power where we've been able to achieve a better gradient, as we saw at Dollery Bridge, and actually we also, in, in the late 1980s, uh, regraded the power um, under Balgowan Bridge, and I think on the inspection, I think I showed, pointed out the underpinning work that had been done on the bridge there. Um, and that, that regrading work was what enabled the outfall for the wastewater treatment works to be installed. Well, I, I was really m meaning any physical changes to the benefited land uh, what, what I, I think there's been there have been obviously changes in land use uh, I could think of one area which used to be our cultural land which is now forestry um, but other than that the, I mean, the, if I may just direct the question at the, the Balgowan area I mean I, I, on, the, on the original survey plan I'm looking at there doesn't appear to be any development there no um, what, well originally this was um, originally this land was part of Balgowan Estate, which was primarily to the north of the Pau, and then there was a sawmill, which I would imagine would have started off as the estate sawmill. Yes. And then it would have been taken over by an independent timber merchant. Railway in between. Yeah. So, um, am I right in saying, it, at the time this plan was drawn, that this this was undeveloped land? It then yeah, subsequently it been, it became been, developed it for land. a sawmill. The other, the other change um, on this survey, as Hughes just pointed out, is the railway. There was no railway in eighteen. 46, right. um, and the, which now was closed by Mr. Beeching, but um, there was a railway constructed okay. along here. Okay. Th th thank you, Mr. Guest. If I could just maybe continue, I've got a few few further points. Uh, the, the the third of my point relates to um, the imposition of a cap or a ceiling. Uh, as the committee will know, the promoter opposes a cap uh, for the annual assessments for the reason that this may place an unworkable and unacceptable limitation on the exercise of the statutory duty of the commissioners in their repair, maintenance and improvement uh, in order that, that the POW uh, operates in a way that, that's effective uh, drainage-wise. That's why we're opposing a cap. I do think there is, though, a, perhaps a relationship between the suggested right of appeal, which is being suggest which is being put forward by the promoters, and a cap, in a sense that it does allow some check and balance to be exercised by um, heritors, should they choose to exercise that right. And that, that right to review appeal uh, to an independent expert was suggested in the promoter's letter uh, of the 11th October 2017. And I thought it might just be helpful to me just to unpack that a little bit. Now, as, as committee members are aware, the, the, the principal concerns of the Commission in regard to introducing a right of appeal related to cost, efficiency and speed and indeed fairness to all heritors. 
Um, as has been illustrated by the, the, the promoter uh, in evidence today, if one, uh, if one heritor seeks an appeal, the cost of that appeal needs to be borne by all of the heritors. And it's a, quite a, a unique position in, in my submission because it's not often you have a sort of right of appeal where uh, there's a limited um, amount of people who have to contribute towards the costs of proce processing that appeal and indeed to pay for that whether it succeeds or fails. So I think it is a very um, unique position that the, the Commission and the Committee finds itself in. And, and what, that, that's why we had introduced the concept of there having to be 10 or more heritors to exercise that right. I, I, I should also say that the, the Commissioners also gave serious consideration to individual rights of appeal. Uh, on the basis that because there was going to be an impact on costs, whether that appeal succeeded or failed, that they should perhaps have a, have a, a the independent expert or the independent expert should be given the right to award costs. But it was felt that the, because we're dealing with relatively small sums, the costs of uh, or, or the should I, sorry, I need to choose my words more carefully. The, the 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 existence of a right to award costs would be a deterrent to those who might want to appeal in the sense that you know the, 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 the appeal may be over a few hundred, it may be over 500 pounds, hypothetically speaking, but the actual costs, if they were awarded against um, the, the appellant, would be enough to really negate that right of appeal. Um, that's why we sort of moved away from the, the, the right of appeal by one heritor only and thought we needed to have a sort of combined weight of uh, heritors such as 10. Uh, we did, we did uh, in our discussions, um, consider who the, who the right of appeal should be made to. Uh, we went for the independent expert appointed by the, the, the drainage authorities uh, organisation because we thought that would be faster. Uh, we considered arbitration, we thought that would be too lengthy, and we are dealing with a relatively short window in terms of setting budgets. We thought about the Lands Tribunal or the Sheriff, but again, these were felt to be, uh, they, they would actually be too costly and they would not be quick enough in their decision making. So that's where we got to the, to the independent uh, expert. So now, about the timetable of it. Uh, I mean, what's, what's been happening up to now is that we, um, we, we generally inspect the POW around about February time. Work has to be carried out during the summer months, partly for SEPA and partly also for a practical reason that if it's, if it's, if the bank, if it's carried out in the summer months, the water is low and if the banks are disturbed, it gives them time to grass up again before you get winter floods. So we're always aiming to do the work in the summer months, which means you need to book the contractor by, say, April to be certain that he's going to turn up during the summer, which means we need to instruct him by, you know, March. So the idea is we inspect the power in February, we decide on what the priorities are, we then instruct the, uh, we then have a meeting to decide what needs to be done and instruct the contractor so he's got plenty of time and notice to do the work. Now, if we, with, with the appeal process, we'd have to allow for the time there's a, there's a, what's proposed at the moment is a review followed by appeal process. So we'll have to allow time for that, working backwards from instructing the contractor in April. So instead of uh, deciding on the work in March, we'll have to probably decide it two or three months earlier, you know, November, December, or probably, probably October, November, we'll have to decide on the work to be done. So we, the, the budget will inherently be less accurate because we, we won't know at that point what damage might be done to the power over the winter months. We also won't know whether there's going to be an appeal or not. So we'll have to include in the budget a provisional sum for winter damage. We'll have to include in the budget a provisional sum for the, an, an appeal, if there is one. You see what I mean? So, so that we can then, so that when we get to the point of, um, of, of the spring, we know whether, this, whether there has been an appeal or not. We know what damage has been done over the winter, and we can then confirm the work to be done. Okay. If, if I can maybe just continue, because the, the, the commissioners uh, have been reflecting on the, the preliminary stage report and indeed the, the preliminary stage debate. 
and and have reflected further on whether the the whether it would be possible to offer some additional protection. Uh, and I can maybe just unpack this for you. You may have some some questions about this, but but what what may be possible? And I, I stress that it's not the sort of preference of the of the commission because they think um, the one we have at the moment on the table for. Uh, the ten heritors is adequate, but it, it would be possible to introduce a right of appeal for any heritor, so that wouldn't be numbers, just any heritor, uh, to lodge an appeal if the draft annual budget exceeds, for example, three times the twenty thousand pound annual assessment index linked. So, for example, say it went to sixty thousand pounds, there would be an automatic right to have an appeal against that to an independent expert. That's not quite a cap, but it's kind of, it's kind of related to, to, to a cap. And, and you, you've got the kind of situation where I think, um, sort of coincidentally, I've met Mr. Davis where his, his charge under at 20,000 at the moment would be say 51 pounds. If it went triple that, he would have an automatic right individually to have a right of appeal, to have that looked at, to see if it was within the, the you know, whether it was a, a, an acceptable budget in terms of the Act and on the judgment of the independent commissioner. And I would say that, that we're using the 20,000 as the benchmark, as the base, but that would be index linked. So the bill going forward, that would go up. So it would be three times that. So the, the, these, these sort of two rights of appeal, one for the 10 heritors uh, who can can actually appeal whatever the budget's set at. And then we have the other one for individual heritors who can go if it goes up three times. We're, we're, we're that's not our preference, but th these could operate in combination with one another. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's something which we have reflected on. And I, I know that you feel strongly about rights of appeal. Um, so we're, we're certainly open to discuss it further. If you have questions about it, that that that's that's really all I had uh, to say in terms of presenting our case, and we're we welcome any questions from Mr. Davis or from a supplementary point, right. which is that, for a practical point of view, we have actually used the same contractor to do the work on the POW for the last thirty years. It's been the same person, and he does an excellent job. He does pretty well all the all the land drainage uh, for the farms in the surrounding area. He knows all the farmers, and he's totally trustworthy, and I think his charges are very reasonable. Now, if we, what I'm worried about is that if we had to go out to tender every time, we would lose that continuity, we would lose that intimate knowledge of how the power works, and we would, um, you know, the chap, you'd, you'd have somebody who's just going to be in for one year, and then he wouldn't know whether he's going to be there the following year. We would lose the fact that, that doing the work on the power, there's a lot of interaction with the local farmers, to, take, to get access and to make, make practical day-to-day -day arrangements. If we have a contractor in there who doesn't know all the local farmers and doesn't know all the people, it would take, it would be a lot more, you know, you might save a few quid on the cost of the work, but there'll be an awful lot more time and expense in supervising it and making sure he didn't, the work was done properly and didn't upset all the local farmers. Okay. Our guest and Mr. McKee, and I invite Mr. Davis make any comments or questions it has to the promoters. Okay. I do just have a few, few questions <laughs> to ask. Um, the, the, sorry. Oh, yep, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the, 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 the charge is, is for those who benefit from the POW. So in relation of the Balgowan estate, who, who releases water into the POW? The, the Manor Kingdom development all drains to that wastewater treatment works. And I think the original idea was that that was going to be um, common property amongst the development, rather like the, well, there's the open, there's the open areas in the development. Uh, it's rather like if you have a block of flats and uh, the external walls and the stairway are in common ownership of the people who own the individual flats. And my understanding is that that was the intention when Manor Kingdom started the development and that the individual properties each have a, have a, sh a shared, uh, that, that the, you know, the open spaces and the common areas of that development, including the wastewater treatment works, are in common ownership of all the householders. And there was originally going to, I think there was a deed of conditions 
deed of conditions, and that's what's reflected in your in your title. And what happened was that Manor Kingdom, um, off, they, once they built all the houses, they just wanted out, so they offloaded it onto this organisation called it's Green Green Greencoat, Greenbelt. Greenbelt. That's right. And Greenbelt, and they were given a lump of money, which in theory lasts forever, and um, that covers the cost of running that treatment works and maintaining the common areas forever, we hope. So, so who releases water into the power? Well, it, the, it goes, well, it's from that wastewater treatment works. Well, actually, I'll go further. The, yeah, the, the waste treatment water releases its, uh, its uh, sewage effluent in, but I believe every house releases its own drainage water into the, into the power. How does it do that? Through its drains. Who, so when the water <coughs> leaves my property and goes into the drains, who, who owns the land upon which those drains flow? Are you asking me who owns the land between your house and the uh, and the pow? I think it, I think it'll be in common ownership, in the same way as who owns the the green area in the middle of the you know who owns that. I don't think you can uh, lose responsibility for your drainage water just because it uh, passes through someone else's land. Lawyers can correct me, but I don't think that so means uh, it's uh, not your water drainage water. That's not that's not necessarily my question here. Is who who owns the land from which the water re is released into the power? So I my, think you be... do from the one that it comes from. You release it. I don't release anything into the power. The, it goes from the sewage works, treatment works. Which you release it from your property and it ends up in the power. Yeah, but it doesn't go directly into the power from my property. It goes, as I understand it, it goes to the sewage treatment works. That's right. Now, I don't know where it goes after that. Well, I tell you, it goes into the power. Okay. So well, the, 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 so old, the old drains in the, in the <coughs> ground on which you're built on won't go to the, the drainage works. They'll go straight to the power. The, I doubt the old land drains are still... There's a, there's a, there are two pipes. They are there's everywhere one, else. There's one from the wastewater treatment works into the power, and there's another one which goes into the cow gas, which runs into the power. So, I two, two question, large pipes. Is, I, my understanding is, but it appears that you're not entirely clear on who releases water into the power, um, is that the owner of the treatment works releases, releases water into the power? Well, the owner of the treatment works will be, I'm not sure whether it's Greenbelt or whether it's the house owners who have common ownership of the whole I mean, thing. It, it is a bit disappointing that you don't actually know who releases water into the power. Because well, that's... Legally, we know who benefits from the water being released into the power, and that's what's legally important. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think what's important is who actually benefits. Why and do you think that? Because it's... Well, benefits, yes. We're with you on benefits. Yeah, who actually benefits? Who releases water into the power? Those are two different things. You've, you've been trying to distinguish, separate the two. We're happy that the people who benefit uh, are, are charged. You're trying to say now that you, you, you don't benefit because it's indirectly, it goes through a drain that someone else owns before it gets to the power. It's, yeah, seems that, a bit spurious to I, I don't, don't agree with that. I don't think it's spurious. I think uh, a landowner has to receive the water that comes downstream from their, uh, upstream from their property. The, for example, if the sewage treatment works uh, was a community sewage works and they were, that was all transported away and disposed of elsewhere, which it could be for all I know, then it doesn't release anything into the power. <coughs> but on that basis, the whole power will be maintained by the landowner who owns the land at the bottom where it runs into the urn. So, wouldn't it? Yeah, but it's all about benefit. What? Well, exactly. It's yeah. all about benefit, and I don't believe I have any direct benefit because water passes from my property onto someone else's ownership. It passes into the treatment works, and that tr those treatment works, I understand, are owned by Bet Homes, who took on, who 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 was, sub I think, Manor Kingdom. Either I, I don't know, understand what exactly happened to Manor Kingdom, but Bet Homes now own, as I understand, the treatment works. So, and I, maybe that's information for you today, but. The, it's bet homes who actually release, I would imagine, anything into the power. We don't do drainage, we enable drainage. We dig a bigger hole so that your drains can work. But it's, it's not and my... It's our not, hole is still there and you are benefiting from it. It's not my drain, though. It's not... I don't release well, it. Well, that's where we've got to. In the, OK, that's the where we... That is the nub of the matter. You've you stated, and you may be correct, it's not your drain, but I don't think that gets around your benefit. I think it entirely does, because I don't think I have to pay for someone else's direct benefit. If the power wasn't maintained and those outfalls blocked up, your house would be not worth a lot. Well, you could have, have no drainage. 
it's, it, that, that might be the point, but that's, that's, I, I don't think that's entirely relevant. The, the point is... Right. It's totally relevant. I, I don't... Who actually releases water into the PAL is the person who directly benefits, or the organisation who directly benefits. Well, in that way, well, it, it, well if, that, if we want to take that line, then... I, then, then we, we, well, actually, when, uh, when the Manor Kingdom development um, started, what we wanted to do was to raise a single assessment against the Manor Kingdom, and then Manor Kingdom would have a uh, would, would then deal with all the householders, and there would be a service charge which they'd all yeah. pay. Much simpler for us, because we'd raise one assessment yeah. instead of fifty-four, yeah. and that was our preference. But Manor Kingdom wouldn't do that, mm. which is why we have to deal with all the individual fifty-four people. So, I mean, that's that's a, my question has been: Who releases water into the power? It's clear, not exactly clear, who who actually does that. Who owns the land? Who owns the 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 the, the, the infrastructure? And I, and it is slightly concerning that we've got to this point with the bill, and it's not clear who releases water into the power. And my point is that I think the person who directly benefits, i.e., who directly releases water into the power, is the one who should be charged. Now, they may pass that charge on to. A uh, third party, but that's that's but that's they won't another do it point. Because we've, we've, already, we've already asked that question. Uh, uh, as I say, when the when the when the Manor Kingdom, when we were discussing with Manor Kingdom, whenever it was years ago, they wouldn't do that because we wanted to have, as I say, a single charge to whoever was going to be factoring all the common parts of that development, and then they would deal with all the individual householders. But they wouldn't do that. Oh, okay, that's uh, disappointing, but but hit, hit historical. We deal with all the, that's why we have to deal with all the individuals. And under the current Act. There, yeah. there are houses uphill from you. Would you accept that you're responsible for their drainage water because it comes under your house to get to the POW? Uh, well, it depends what you mean by drainage, because, of course, there'll be some um, water which will flow into the groundwater under the property. Drainage from the rooftops from that would go into the communal drainage system, I assume. I think... I think if we were going to get down to how much surface water was created through my garden or someone else's my garden, I think we're, we're getting on pretty ten, on, on very minimal amounts of liquid because you've got to have to factor in the transpiration and the interception that occurs through the vegetation in my garden. So actually how much water goes in. But as my point is all the water that hits my roof goes into the drains and goes onto someone else's land. I don't own that land. I don't know what, what they do with it. All the foul water goes out of my property into someone else's land and I don't know what they do with it. Well, my question. Can I just answer that, um, um, Mr. Davis? We're having quite a, an interesting academic discussion here about whether your property is or is not benefited. But, but you, you have stated in your letter of objection, and I'm just going to quote this to you. I have, however, come to understand the purpose of the POW and its history, and I understand and accept I have to contribute towards its maintenance. Now, when you made that statement may we agree that you must have had it in your mind that you were in some way at least benefiting from the POW, otherwise you wouldn't have accepted it and be prepared to contribute towards its maintenance. Uh, earlier on, thank you for repeating my objection. Yeah, um, Earlier on in my evidence I did state, uh, perhaps I didn't make it clear, I've come to a different position um, uh, to what I wrote in my original objection and I've come <laughs> to the conclusion that actually I don't directly benefit and I shouldn't my property shouldn't be in the benefited lands. So that, I'm pretty sure that's different to my original objection and uh, arguably I should have <coughs> given it greater consideration at the time. But I don't agree that my land directly, my property directly benefits from the power because there's no direct relationship with the power. We'll have to disagree. Um, so I'll move on to another question. Um, uh, just relating to flooding, and I, I, I went through various documents. I don't, would it be worth me requoting those or for the record they were already? Um, mm -hmm. Do you wish? If you wish to, you may. Yeah, okay. um, I, I've received a number of, and there's a number of point, uh, quotes here relating to issues around flooding. And on the 13th of January 2015, McCash and Hunter sent me a letter explaining that the Powers Commission has charged as levy for the purpose of ensuring that the power burn is cleared and dredged so as to prevent flooding of the lands in this area. And then it goes on to say, your property benefits from these works in the absence of which you'll be at risk of flooding. In the notice for Heritage Meeting Gas Call, 2nd uh, of March 2015, it, it says that it is therefore vitally important that the power is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. In the uh, commission, consultation paper present, prepared by the Power and Chaffery Commission is in May 2016, it repeats that line. It, it says it is therefore vitally important that the power is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. In the, the memorandum 
promoter's memorandum to the bill submitted to Parliament earlier this year, it says again, it is therefore vitally important that the power is maintained to prevent flooding in this area. And even up to the site visit, we had a, a brief dialogue about flooding. Um, I think it was captured in the notes. I think it's quite clear that the flooding, that flooding alleviation is, a, is a, a side benefit of the drainage commission because before, um, the, before, when, before when the Manor Kingdom development was um, under consideration, Ovarup, who were the flood consultants for Manor Kingdom, came to see me, and I showed them the plans which showed the regrading of the POW under Balgowan Bridge, and they took away that. There's a longitudinal section which shows it all in some detail, and they were very interested in that. And it's interesting that the drains, the outfalls from the, from the um, uh, wastewater treatment works and the surface water outfall there are set at levels which it could not have set at, could not be set at, if those regrading works had not been carried out by the Commission. So, my, thank you for that, Chair. My, my question is, if flooding is a side issue, which I, I very much believe it is more than a side issue, I don't believe there's any evidence to support that flooding is an issue and none has been provided, but we say this so it's a side issue, a minor issue, not an issue at all. Why has it been stated several times it's vitally important that the work of the Commission is carried out to prevent flooding in the area? Well, if you look at the, if you look at the agricultural land, for example, there are quite large areas of agricultural land within the benefited area which, in, in, bad, we in bad weather, flood. And, it, we, and however, however well we maintain the power, they will not, we will not stop them flooding, but they can be drained because the power is at an, uh, at a, uh, at, is deep enough to allow drainage. So, I mean, I've got some on my own farm, fields which uh, flood, if we, in, in bad winter weather they flood, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of growing winter crops on them, but they do grow spring crops because one can drain them. So that, no, I accept that in respect of agricultural land, but specifically the Balgowan sawmill site, as it says here. In addition, the Commission's work has made residential development possible in some areas, such as the former Balgowan sawmill site. It is therefore vitally important that the power is maintained to prevent flooding this area. That, the linking of those two sentences suggests to me that what the Commission is saying is vitally important to, to undertake the work to prevent flooding in the, in, on the Balgowan site. Yeah, I'll stand by that. Why not? Um, we're clear in the legal documents that the service provided is one of drainage, but the reason I pay the drainage bills is to prevent flooding, and I completely believe that your site would flood without a thousand years. If we undo the thousand years of drainage, I completely believe that the reason you should pay it is to prevent flooding as well. Well, I think there's two separate things, because when we're past those thousand years of drainage work, we are where we are with respect to the power and what it currently is. There's, there's no... That's history. No, it, it requires annual maintenance it. You know, to no, no, preserve it. The work undertaken on the power is history. No, it goes on every year. Well, we'd like it to go on every year. Yeah, but, the work but if we stop that work, we will revert to our original state. To the original state of a thousand years ago? Yeah. What, um, if you look down the valley, you'll see that until the Balgarn development, all the houses up and down that valley are above... There are none on this benefited area plan. Mm. They're all above it for a very good reason. Yeah, yeah, understandably, but we, yeah. I'm not talking about the other houses. I'm talking about my house. Your, on houses, your house is on the benefited area. All the houses at this time were built above the benefited area. Yeah, 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 um, which was built on, on high ground. Is yeah. there any evidence? Have you got any evidence to say that flooding is an issue for my house? No, the evidence is that you benefit from the drainage. So flooding is not the issue? It's not the legal issue. If I was you, I would be very concerned about flooding as well. I, I, I'm not very concerned because I have, there's no evidence to support that flooding is an issue. It's been maintained that... When you do get evidence, what evidence do you want? Water in your home? I mean, what... It, 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 well, see, the super map obviously supports my point, but however, that is, a, that is a, 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 an assessment, that is no doubt a model, but there is still no evidence to support flooding is an issue. Has there been a hydrological assessment by a net relevant expert of the catchment and the potential flooding? Of course not. My point is this. It's stated several times it is vitally important that the power is maintained from flooding in, in, in this area, which I think would be fair to assume that is my house. There is no evidence to assume that. It's been identified as a minor issue. Uh, there's been no hydrological assessment. As Joe said, it's a, a side issue. I would argue this. All my neighbours, and I include myself in that, have been under the impression through this documentation, although I've, I've maintained my position right from the outset, that flooding is an issue. 
If it's not an issue, why is it repeatedly said in the documentation that is vitally important? Because flooding is such an emotive issue. It's such a, you, know, you see people's houses flooded on the news and you think, I don't want that to happen to my house. However, there is no evidence whatsoever to support the statement that it's vitally important that powers maintain to prevent flooding in this area. I would suggest that it would need to be carefully considered, if this was never included at the outset in any of the consultation documents, that we don't know how people would have reacted to this bill. I, 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 I'm surprised this is still maintained, that it is vitally important, because there's no evidence to support it. Can, 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 I, can I answer, at least in part, your, your yeah. question? I'm just looking at the um, preliminary stage report, and I'm just, just on the issue about flood risk mapping, and uh, one of the conclusions in that is the committee noting from SEPA, Scottish Environment Protection Agency, which indicate that its flood risk mapping should not be used to assess land which benefits from the POW. Okay? Understand that? The, the, the other conclusion that, that has reached is, it says, having visited the area in question, the committee is satisfied that the drainage of the POW, the, the, the drainage the POW provides is essential for the drainage of surface water and waste for the houses in the Balgowan area. So that's a conclusion which has been okay. reached. That's a helpful clarification. I mean, the, the point SEPA are making is different to flooding. In respect for benefit, it's different to flooding. They're not saying that it, that it might be at risk from flooding because just because their map, you know, that's a, that's a different point. I, I, I would just submit to that. I'll move on once I've made this final point. I would submit to you that, that, that it, all the documentation is indicated to Nate, my, me and my neighbours that our houses will flood if, if the PAL... Isn't that was certainly very in, when, I, when they came to see me, were certainly very interested to know that the regrading works which we'd carried out would be maintained. So, but I, there's no evidence to support that. Well, it's um, not in the. It's not in the. There's. It's not in the bill. Why well, is it why being? Is it, why is it? Why should it be in the bill? Well, because you said it's vitally important to maintain to prevent flooding in the area. So therefore, if it's of vital importance, why isn't it in the bill? Well, we, we, we have an obligation, as I say, to maintain the power in its, you know, obviously we have an obligation to maintain the power in a, as a proper drain, yeah. I, 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 I don't say this is in any way deliberate, but I, I, I think people, I think this is, uh, these, some of this wording is a little misleading. I don't think so, because we're trying to update the 1846 Act, and the 1846 Act says at the beginning of it, uh, in the preamble, it says it is for the better draining and improving of the lands adjacent to the river or stream called the Power of Inchaffery. It does not talk about flooding. It talks about draining, better draining. Here but, we are. But, but you've maintained it's vitally important that the power's maintained print flooding in this area. That's been and right the, through the documentation. the 1996 Act says exactly the same thing. Mm. So why is it why has it been repeated? It's vitally important to prevent flooding in this area. If it's not in the 1696, the 1846, not in the 2018, when, whenever the bill passes? Well, primarily because we can't actually prevent flooding. The fl we can drain as much as we, we want, but we cannot in the Act promise to there will be no floods. And that is why we can't promise it in an Act of Parliament. Um, it is primarily because we believe that it will happen anyway to a certain extent. <coughs> what we will do is work as hard as we can to improve the drainage and thereby, as a free benefit, um, we all get what we need, which is a, a freedom from flooding. My, my point is this, that I think there's been a mis these are misleading statements. I don't say it's deliberate, I think it's just, it, it, it's been misleading. And I would put the question, and I'll leave it there and I'll move on to my next point, uh, that we don't know how heritors would have reacted to this bill, to the so-called consultation prior to it that you undertook, if the flooding statement had been removed and it, and it specified that it was about drainage and that flooding wasn't an issue. And I think that undermines much of the process to date. Yeah, I acknowledge that. I'll, I'll, I'll move on to state labour in this particular point. <laughs> and just think, uh, do we have a particular time, time frame for our conclusion of our session today? I don't want to kind of... An hour ago, was that? <laughs> Sorry, Alison. Precision is appreciated. Yeah, OK, right. I'll, 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 I'll look at the, what I had prepared question-wise. And I don't, I don't want to make points for the sake of making points, just, just to get communicate what I wish to.
it, it actually may be worth if I actually make my final few points in summing up rather than continue questioning because I, we may be a quicker way to get to what, I'm at, what I actually wish to state rather than following questions with that. Okay. With that. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr yeah. Davis. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you to both. I would now like to invite the uh, promoters to make any final points or wish in summing up. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I'll be brief. Um, in the promoter's view, benefited land is properly identified on the parliamentary plans which, which are before you. Uh, in terms of fairness and proportionality, the promoter maintains its position that the basis for charges, the annual assessments under the POW bill, are fair and equitable across all of the different categories of land, agriculture, woodland, amenity, commercial and residential that's of categories of land which benefits directly from the POW. As the commissioners are all heritors, they will continue to have a strong invested interest in avoiding unnecessary expenditure and minimising the level of the annual assessment. It is considered that the rights of appeal review suggested by the commissioners uh, and indeed the, the, the new right which I announced today are both fair and proportionate having regard to the unique circumstances of the commission. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Mr Davis to make any closing remarks. OK, thank you. Having listened to the points made today, I still maintain that the proposed bill is unfair, disproportionate, lacking any evidence base, and will confer significant power onto a small group of landowners who are very much the minority of those covered by the bill. So, and I believe my property should be removed from the benefit of land because I do not discharge anything into the power, nor does it provide any flood mitigation benefits to me. I do not own any of the systems which discharge water into the power, and therefore why should I be charged? The balance of power in the proposed bill is wrong, and the proposers of the bill should reassess the mechanisms to protect heritors and ensure transparency and value for money and stop significant annual charge increases. I will just make a couple of supplementary points. Uh, presumably the power was maintained in good order prior to the construction of Balgowan. Yet it seems there is a tremendous amount of income under the, old, the, uh, the previous assessment derived from the properties of Balgowan, with no assessment of the impacts of Balgowan Estate. Therefore, I consider it disproportionate. Balgaon, but prior to Balgowan, the power was presumably managed accord correctly, maintained correctly, and Balgowan Estate was then built. Now, Balgowan Estate will have an impact, and the charge should be a result of that impact, yet the charge is 40% of the total bill, and I say that's disproportionate to the benefit to Balgowan. Secondly, there's been no assessment of the actual land, of the differing land ownership. So, for example, Balgowan Estate's as a, as a member of Balgaon uh, uh, community, I, uh, the, the, the Balgaon community, the, sorry, the Balgaon estate benefits in some way and inputs in some way. However, if I'm a farmer, I, input, I benefit greatly because of the potential to r remove flood water from my property, but I also my impact is also potentially very significant. And what we haven't considered is the intensive ploughing work that takes place in the catchment. When intensive ploughing takes place and there's significant rainwater, that washes off silt into the power. And I would argue that the most significant cost of the, of the work with the maintenance of the power is digging out that silt. So therefore, farmers benefit the most and impact the power the most, and no proper assessment has been made of that particular point. And I just lastly made a, a, my very last point on the consultation which was undertaken prior to the submission of the bill. Um, I wouldn't say it was a particular; it wasn't. A, it was a poor consultation process. I asked the question whether or not any changes to the bill had been made as a result of the consultation. I asked for a, a record of the comments which were made, and to date I've not received any of that information. So I can only assume that the the bill which was submitted to Parliament was exactly the same as the commissioners developed prior to the consultation period being undertaken. So uh, that would be my final point. I conclude my sum up on, on that. Thank you very much, Mr Davis. Um, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank everyone for attending today. The next meeting of the committee will be on Wednesday, 17th January 2018 at 10am, and, and it will be to consider the objections and for the committee to consider its consideration report. It just remains for me to say to wish everyone a very happy Christmas and a very good New Year. The committee will now move into a private session and suspend briefly.